So welcome to day three of five more ways over five days for us to cope with COVID-19. Today we're going to focus our attention on working with people with intellectual disabilities. We're going to think about the perspective of the relatives and carers of people with intellectual disabilities and how they best support those people. We're also going to think about the perspective of the person with an intellectual disability and how they understand some of the changes in their day-to-day -day routines that COVID-19 has brought to them. Okay, so Paul, what advice would you give to a family member or a support worker of somebody with an intellectual disability during COVID-19? Yeah, I think the big thing is, I suppose we've got to look at the communication style of the person. So if somebody naturally is willing to share their thoughts, willing to share their worries, then we want to make sure we continue that. Now, if somebody's quite private, we don't want to kind of keep asking them questions. So I would say maybe setting aside 10 minutes a day, maybe at the same time every day, and asking the person, um, would you like to talk about anything? And it doesn't have to be COVID-19 related. It could be anything. Just it's a safe space and a safe time. We don't want to spend more than 10 minutes because we get into a loop of worries and we can actually make the person more frustrated. I think another thing to think about is the current need of the person. So if the person is very independent and is following the guidelines, we don't want to disable that person. So we might actually offer practical support instead. For example, helping with an online food shop. And I think the problem at the moment is a lot of people are trying to fuss maybe and trying to offer lots of assistance. And what that can do is disable somebody with disability and then they can become dependent on the person and then afterwards feel frustrated. So it leads to disagreements. So we want to avoid, I suppose, giving too much attention to, to anybody. We want to just give people their space and we all benefit from that. And also this personality aspect. If we're naturally a worrier, what I would say is that reassurance is important, but I think what we don't want to do is to keep reassuring a person all day. We want to focus on what the person can do. So if, for example, I want to, a person wants to go to a movie on Friday night and now they can't go and usually go every Friday, what we can do is say, well, we could have movie night in our own house and we can make your favourite popcorn and I think we're reinventing ways of existing rather than saying what we're doing without. So I think that's a big part of it kind of, and again, it's focusing on the positive and don't make COVID bigger than it needs to be. And sometimes there is that part of constant reminders well, what I found in my work is constant reminders can, I suppose, heighten the arousal level of people and then people are exhausted and when people are exhausted they're more likely to, I suppose, enter into disagreements with each other and people are confined to a small space so that's very important. Is there any specific guidance that you would give to a carer of somebody on the autistic spectrum? Yeah, from my work with people with ASD I think a big problem at the moment is the change of routine. People usually with ASD have a very, I suppose, personalised and individualised routine that they enjoy. And now all of a sudden, all the routine has changed without their, them having any input into it. And with that changing so much, a lot of people are getting very, very frustrated. And they're taking out maybe on their family members. I think a big part here is normalising that everybody's routine has been affected. And it's not the family member's fault or their fault. It's actually something all of us have to follow. And I suppose routines are reassuring. So what I want to point out is that the routine will come back again in the future. We can't say when, it'll be a number of months away maybe. We could say what we find in intellectual disability and ASD is to over, overly exaggerate the time rather than under. And then people are usually pleased if it happens sooner than they expected. People I think with ASD are more likely to invest in change if there's a benefit to them. So for example, if they usually go to a, a, a cafe on a Tuesday morning, every Tuesday now can't go, that if it can maybe sold to them that, look, you spend usually seven or eight euros every Tuesday, and what we can do instead is we can save that money, put it in a money jar, and we can go on a holiday or a day trip with that money. And at the same time, we can make a hot chocolate at home, and you can FaceTime your friend you meet. So a way then of helping as well is every week count the money, with that person to show how much they've saved. Because a lot of times if you've given a visual to the person of the benefit of what they're doing, they're usually much more likely to invest and be happy with that change. A lot of people as well, I suppose, with ASD are very, I suppose, focusing on the guidelines and they feel that they're following the guidelines really well. 
but they're very disappointed when they see other people out in the street maybe not following maybe social distancing or other rules and feel quite angry about this and can get quite focused on this. So what I would suggest to explain to people is that each of us has our own responsibility just for ourselves and not for anybody else. So if we keep that in mind that that's their responsibility, you have your responsibility and you just have to worry about yourself. And that's what I would say is very important. So Paul, what do we do if somebody with an intellectual disability gets upset? Yeah, I think a big part is to validate and normalise their feelings because a lot of us are very frustrated ourselves and at this point we can't see our friends or loved ones and we can maybe see the benefit of this because we know it's to keep us safe and it's for the greater good in the future but if you do have an intellectual disability this is much harder and I suppose a lot of people are getting upset by um, their, their own reaction to this and they feel that maybe they could be affected by uh, COVID, some are fearing that maybe they might get ill themselves or a loved one. So I suppose what we would talk about in this part is about a person's own reaction. So maybe that it's not COVID is causing our feelings, it's our own worry and our own stress. And I would focus on a way of how we've coped before with those difficulties. So Paul, I know that at the moment, some people are struggling with some of the guidance and in particular, maybe people with intellectual disability are struggling to follow some of that guidance. Are there any kind of hints or tips that you can give to carers in terms of how they'd support their loved one in following some of the COVID-19 guidance at the moment? Yeah, I think some people feel that um, people who aren't maybe following the hand washing let's use that as an example first, the hand washing guidelines, that they feel it's sometimes against them, it's, it's, it's to do it to upset them. What I've found is that some people with an intellectual disability and maybe who have ASD as well, find hand washing experience overly stimulating. So making small changes like using unscented uh, soap or hand wash can make a big difference to the sensory experience for the person. A lot of people are more willing to do it when there isn't a scent or a particular texture to it. Also, I suppose there are people who actually um, don't know how to wash their hands properly. They've actually never done it before. We can see when we go into supermarkets now, never before have we seen the shelves empty for soap. And in my mind, what were people doing before? So now all of a sudden, a lot of people are washing their hands a lot more often and that we've learned how to do it properly. So I would have a laminated step-by-step -step visual guide next to the sink and maybe demonstrating via yourself or via YouTube of how to do it. So a person learns, whether they're a child or an adult, for the first time how to do it. And I suppose we do have those examples of maybe singing happy birthday or that with it. Maybe a person sings their own favorite song while they're washing their hands. Again, that's very useful because with that, when a person's singing, they're distracted, so they're not thinking about the sensory uh, part of washing their hands. So that's a big one. And also the social story. Social stories are very useful for people with intellectual disability about maybe not getting ill. So the story could be you wash your hands before a meal, after a meal, and after you've gone to the toilet, and maybe if you've been out in public, and that way you won't get ill. And again, go back to your laminated step-by-step -step guide, and that should help the person. So it's kind of hand washing. And then we've got social distancing. Um, a lot of people, I suppose, with visual impairments are struggling at the moment. If you've got visual impairments at the moment, Social distancing is very difficult because you can't see what two meter looks like. And even what we use in intellectual disability is two big jumps away. It's too far, it's, we don't understand if we've got a visual impairment. So we've got to make allowances when we see people sometimes not following guidelines because maybe they can't perceive this. If you've got mobility issues as well, for example, if you are a wheelchair user, it's very hard for you to move. So it's very important that the public around them move rather than you move because that person, I suppose, has more difficulty. Sanitization is much harder as well if you've got mobility difficulties or visual difficulties, because you usually have to touch items as you're passing, and you can't always be sure that everything is clean or sanitized. So is there any guidance that you would give to a family member or a support worker in terms of how they look after themselves during COVID-19? It's okay to be frustrated. And remember, I suppose, we've never spent so much time with our families and that's really good but it also can be difficult because usually how people do well together is when they actually have time apart and at the moment when we're maybe cocooning as a family we're in each other's I suppose close quarters all the time 
it's important that we have quiet time ourselves, even if we don't have an intellectual disability. We can learn a lot from the intellectual uh, disabled population because they have good strategies. So quiet time, maybe closing the door and maybe putting a sign outside the door, look, I'm having 10 minutes. I think as well, it's important that we distance ourselves and distract ourselves from, I suppose, the cascade of COVID-19 information because a lot of times we can be so worried about a family member with an intellectual disability that we keep looking for more difficulties and actually it's not going to make it any better by us getting more information. As long as we've got the main snippets of information and we're following HSC guidelines then I think we're doing our job and remember that's all we can do at the moment and all of us are learning together. So if I had an intellectual disability what advice would you give to me? Yeah, I think a big thing at the moment is people are getting a lot of their information about COVID or, or what we call coronavirus. They both mean the same thing. So a lot of people are getting their information from social media and Facebook. And I suppose what we're finding is that a lot of people are getting quite stressed because they're seeing a lot of visuals or kind of pictures online that are very upsetting. And what I would say is that when we're on Facebook, it's a good thing to use. We like Facebook, but maybe scroll past or maybe ignore anything to do with COVID or coronavirus at the moment. And maybe get your information via the news. I know a lot of people uh, don't like watching the news, but maybe get your, the real news. A lot of people might not have heard of the word kind of fake news, but fake news is usually very stressful because it's there to kind of make us feel a certain way. And usually it's not a good way. It's usually to make us upset. So I would say maybe our focus at the moment would be on just watching the news for 10 minutes and then getting on with your day other than that. I mean, a lot of times it's maybe focus on the activities you could do in the past or you would like to do in the future. A lot of people, I suppose, are spending so much time talking about COVID, they're not spending much time doing the things they like doing. Now, a lot of places I'm aware are closed, and, but there are other things we can do. We can FaceTime our friends, so that's a good use of technology. We can chat to them, but we can also do things like if you've liked painting or drawing or anything like this or anything in the house or in the garden. The garden has become, I suppose, the new place we hang out. It's the place we can sit out, maybe we can talk to people in private and also maybe even plant something because I find at the moment doing something like that is very distracting and it takes our mind off those worries. I would also suggest that a lot of people maybe are going, like, like yourself, maybe going to the supermarket every day or shops every day and you're going maybe because of the social part. But what I would say is that you're more likely to get the virus if you keep going different places. It might be better to maybe go for one big shop a week or get the food delivered and maybe talk to people on FaceTime instead because going there every day isn't going to be helpful to you. And, and I suppose it's okay to feel lonely at times, we all do, but it's okay to have quiet time. Quiet time is good too, in your room, and maybe read that book or write that letter that we never got to do for the last six months. Now is maybe the time to do that. How can I stay happy during COVID-19? I think feeling happy at the moment is, is a big goal for all of us really. All of us are trying our best. I think some people are turning to things that aren't great, maybe like alcohol every day and maybe there are other things that we could do to make ourselves feel a bit better. I like the idea of setting up maybe what we call a kind of a happy toolbox. So something that helps build our resilience. Now what I mean by resilience is kind of our happy spirit. Okay, and within that happy toolbox we would have things that do make us happy. It could be something next to us on uh, the chair we usually sit in a box. It could be favourite photographs. It could be a, a book we like. I like holiday magazines about maybe dreaming for the future. So maybe holiday magazines, you can still order those online or ask somebody to help you order those and they can be delivered and you can think about the future. I also think if you like music or particular songs, you could put those in maybe in a CD a CD or you could have your music next to you there. I like chocolate and I think that maybe putting a favourite bar of chocolate or a favourite packet of crisps into that box kind of helps you through those rough times and, and I think the hat box is something that you could take with you downstairs in your sitting room and maybe up to your bedroom if that's something you need to move when you're feeling a bit low as well. Um, I think a visual timetable is very important because at the moment we usually have structure 
and at the moment there's, there is no structure. So we need to put that back in. And I like colour coding things. And what I mean by colour coding is I like the idea of maybe giving red for maybe jobs I've got to do in the week. I like the idea of putting for maybe for mealtimes blue and for green maybe relaxation or fun things. And I'm going to mark up the whole week and I'm going to put different things in the different colours. So at meal times, I say one o'clock to two o'clock every day, I'll have blue. And then in the morning, I'll do some jobs and the afternoon, some relaxation. A lot of people feel they should fill the whole week with relaxation. But if we've got worries in our mind, what we find is that jobs are just as good at helping us keep our mind off things. So I would think it's a good idea to balance the jobs with the relaxation. And I also think as well, it's okay to sometimes get frustrated and maybe explain to people, look, I'm feeling a bit upset or frustrated and say, look, I'm actually gonna to head to my room for a little bit. So heading to your room becomes your safe place and it becomes somewhere that you can maybe be annoyed and frustrated and when you feel a bit better, come back out again. And, and I suppose a big thing is being, I suppose, compassionate to yourself. Realize that this is, I suppose, this is not caused by you you did not cause coronavirus or COVID-19, you know, and it will end. And I suppose on that journey between now and then, we will have fun. So, and the fun will continue afterwards. So maybe keep that in mind when you're having a really rough day.